Hello, everyone. Um, let us talk a bit about implementing inductive definitions. And this is basically, um, to put it in other words, is how do we uh, interpret and implement the mathematical notations that I've been using in my slides. So inductive definitions, for the sake of this discussion, are just a way to define recursive functions uh, in a, using a mathematical notation. We've been using two, form of, two forms of notation or two cate categories that I'm going to cover in the next few slides. Um, but keep in mind that uh, such formalism can be used to represent any kind of relation, not just functions. But for the sake of our discussion, uh, and in this course, we're only covering and we're only interested in function. That means that all the possible rules, there's only one they're all disjoint, so you only have one possibility. You cannot have two rules being enabled at the same time. So you can implement each one independently. You don't have to think about their interaction. Um, so, whoops, the wrong way. Okay, so one of the notations that you've seen is the equation notation. Um, and in this equation, when you have equations, is basically you're going to have one per line, and you're going to have on the right hand side an if like you see here, and then a condition, if, and a precondition. And then you're going to have an expression. Uh, so currently we're using equals, right? So we have, on the left-hand side, we have, uh, we are defining the function. So what we're saying is, we want to define the function m. And effectively, what we're trying to say is, we're defining function m by branches. And instead of writing a big curly brace, we're doing each line here, because there might be multiple branches. In this case, there's only two and each branch is this line, um, but technically you could be representing, oh, I don't know, 10 uh, lines, and if you have braces, it might be more confusing. Um, so in this case, we're using it with the equation notation, so you have one branch per each side, right? So each of these lines is going to represent a condition, and the return value is only being returned if the precondition is met, right? So in this case, you have another return value that is only returned if this precondition is met. Okay, so how would we represent that? Actually, let me erase this and re-implement it. Well, I'm defining function m, so I'm going to do define m, and then I have an input parameter n, so that's what I'm going to do. And then because I have two branches, I'm going to have a cond, right? I'm going to have a uh, cond allows me to write conditional statements. Um, and I'm going to have two of them. So let me write the two, and then I'm going to end this. Okay, in the first branch, my condition is that n has to be greater than 100. So I write 100. And what is the return value? Well, it's... Okay. Uh, then, what is the second condition? Second condition is that n is smaller or equal than, than 100. And what is the return value? OK. So now we've implemented the code. So we have two rules, and therefore we have two branches. And then we place each of the conditions on the condition of the cond. And the result value that appears after the equals the right hand side. So that's going to be the return value. So as you can see, it's very close to the, the mathematical notation. So now let me just run two, uh, just call the function with two cases, just to see if this returns anything. Um, and indeed, if we run, we get 91 on each case. So that's all great. We're all very happy. We don't really care about what this function is, done, is doing, al although I already talked about this in, in a previous lesson for trivia, but if you're curious, just search for McCarthy 91. It's a quite famous function. OK, so in summary, this is the implementation that I just wrote. Um, and this is how you would implement this, this uh, specification of the McCarthy function. 
Another way to represent the McCarthy function is with this fraction notation, right? And in the fraction notation, what you write is, again, you, we are writing the equal sign. Then we put on the left-hand side the function that we're trying to define. And here is another branch. And on the right-hand side, we still put the output. So this is the output. And above, we put a precondition. So we have a, a precondition that is saying, I only return this call if this condition is met. I only return this call if this condition is met. So the implementation might not surprise you that it's going to be exactly the same, right? So what you write atop, on top of the bar, you write as a precondition. And what you write on the bottom is just a return value. What you write on the top is there, and what you write on the bottom is here. Note that I didn't write else here, although I know I could write it because these two um, conditions are disjoint. You only have one at the other. Um, but I should always write the closest to what is written in the, in the specification. And in, in your homework, you're not expected to be interpreting it rather than you should be trying to understand it, but you shouldn't trying to be, cre be creative in how you could implement it. Just try to do it, be as close as possible to what is being specified, because that will help you getting it right faster. So another way to write is rather than writing the whole thing, you know, as we wrote before, here as a return value, it might be easier to just represent the multiple function calls as multiple statements, just because it might make um, the code a bit easier, the specification a bit easier to read. So that's what we do in this representation. And now note that we we have multiple preconditions, right? We have this, that, and this one as well. So the first one we left it as it was, but now the way we represented the second branch is a bit different, although it means exactly the same. So how do we do this? Recall that we had nested definitions here. What we did was we introduced some temporary variables like this x here and this y here, and we're using it to say that well, if we compute n plus 11, that gives me some x, okay? And this x we use and we pass it to m again, and that should return some y, and this y is what I'm going to return here, right? So the implementation of, of such formalism should be slightly different. So this is the first example. The second example... should be something like define m again of n. Then I do a cond. And here I do the same branch as before. So let me just copy paste that. And in the second branch, I have, and now because it's basically each, these two are not really Boolean conditions. So I just copy paste them as multiple as the body. So the body is going to be this condition followed by this condition followed by this. So let's write that. So let me write it a bit down. Uh, actually, let me move this below. Okay, so what should we return? Well, first we define x, right? Because we're assigning this to x. And then we're gonna do m of plus n 11. Okay. Secondly, we are defining y, so we do define y and then m of x. Okay, and finally, what do we return? This is just a Boolean condition. It's already captured in this branch, right? Secondly, what do we have? Well, we have that m equals y, so we should finally return y. So now let's call these two calls and let's see if it still returns 91. Ah, it still returns 91. It's returning the same thing because it's exactly the same function. Okay, so the basic idea is that this result should only occur if all of these conditions are met, right? 
but these are just they're not really conditions in the sense they always succeed because this is just saying that n plus 11 equals to some value so we just say oh well we'll just create that actually is translated to some intermediary uh, computation same thing for this equality right and but if we had another condition, we would have an end here. Let's say we had and uh, n is uh, even. You would write something like and and uh, even. Right. If you had another condition here, uh, restricting n even further. But we don't. So let's go back to what we had here. Okay. Um, so this is how we write it. That's exactly what I wrote. Um, another thing that you might be confused about is that um, the distinction between input and output, so that we usually assume when we have an equals, right? We, we assume that everything between the parentheses is inputs and everything out on the right-hand side of the equals is output. Um, but in essence, and if you look at the eval function, it really, there is no equals, right? What we have is really an arrow. So in some communities, it might be really, the function might be so obvious and people have seen it so many times that they don't really want to see like a function call all the time. Um, for instance, if you think about addition, uh, you don't have a function call to add or plus. What you have is just a little sign of plus. Um, so that is the need of notation, right? It, it makes the expression easier to parse and you can understand it more uh, quicker, more quickly. So let's say that this McCarthy function is very common in the radio community. And if they see a little radio, they really understand what that means. Oh, that's just the McCarthy function. That's just this M function that I was talking about before. So if the so in this community, the, the radio sign became really obvious to them and they're very familiar with it. So they don't really want to see the M ampersand. So, so now what we have, somehow the author must have conveyed that meaning and said, well, everything on the left hand side of the radio means an input parameter and everything on the, on the right hand side means an output parameter, right? So now the only thing we did was we just replaced equals by this little radio sign but it represents the same thing exactly, right? So when you see the evaluation function, what you have is you have a down arrow. But what we mean is on the left hand side of the down arrow is the, e is the input and on the right hand side is the output, right? And indeed that's what we have. So the implementation is gonna be the same. The only thing that you have to think about is, well, why do we even have these things? Why don't we have it all nested? Well, if you are using something like an infix notation, such as this little radio sign, then how would you write this? Right? How would you write a nested call? There is no way you could write it because it's infix and the right hand side means the output. So it's not really obvious how you would do that. And that's why you kind of need this intermediate representation like we're doing here, rather than a more concise uh, like we did in this slide. Okay. So finally, what I wanted to discuss, the last thing we wanted to discuss is pattern matching rules. And these are rules that again are defined in branches and we can use again this fraction notation. So we're trying to implement the, or, or specify the quick sort function. And the quick sort function can be described in terms of the structure of its input, rather than some condition like we had here, where we say n is greater or equal than 100 or smaller or equal than 100, uh, what we're actually doing here is we're looking at the structure of the input and we're defining what we should do in terms of that structure. So what is the input? The input is going to be a list. So we're saying if the list is empty, just return the empty list because the list is already sorted. The empty list is. If the list has at least one element, let's call that element the pivot. And then it's the same algorithm that you would be accustomed to. So what we do is we take the rest of the list and then we what this is doing is it's just sorting everything that is smaller than P. And on, the, on L2, you're going to sort recursively everything that is greater than P, the, the pivot. And then what you do is you have the L1, which is sorted, and you have L2, which is sorted, and you concatenate all of them 
with p in the middle. So how do we implement that? Well, let's try to implement that. W this is one condition, and this is another condition. It's implicit, but it's still two conditions. So how do we do that? Well, let's define QS. QS, what do we take? A list. Okay, so let's call it LST. Okay, so now we have a cond, right? And we have two conditions, right? Because we have two rules. So what do we do in the first rule? First rule, we check if the list is empty. So we call it LST. And if it's empty, what do we return? The empty list. So that's what we're returning. Here, what we do, the list has at least something, right? So in this case, I'm just going to write else. OK, otherwise, we are in this case, what do we do? We're going to return something. OK, what do we do first? We have QS here. And then in the middle, we have something going on. What is this? Well, if you think about a bit, it's basically just doing a, fi a filter where we're passing lambda x, where x is smaller than p. OK, but what is p? Ah, p is defined somewhere inside LST, right? So what we need to do now is we need to somehow we need to define p. So let's do that. So what is p? Define p. Well, p is the first of the list, right? What is l? l is the rest of the list. So let's do l rest of LST. OK, so now the expression inside is filter lambda of x, p, all the x's that are smaller than p, and I pass l. And I'm assigning this to what? I'm assigning that to l1. So let's do define l1. OK, now what I do, same thing, l2. Quick sort, filter, lambda, x, greater or equal, x, p, l. Okay, what do we return? Okay, what we return is um, l1, append, l1, and then cons of p, l2. Okay, and finally we have the parenthesis of that. Let me make this a bit bigger. Okay. Now let's see if this worked. We do quick sort. 53, 42. Bracket. Uh, lecture 21. Okay. And the list is sorted. Okay. So the specification was correct. So let's recap what we did. We basically wrote the condition is implicit. And this is closer to what we have in the evaluation, right? What we have in evaluation and substitution, really, the condition is implicit on the structure of the input, right? What we care about is we have to look at the node of the EST. And then what we write is the condition is going to be here or here. And then the return value is basically what is on the bottom, right? Here and here. And the difficulty in this case is just writing down the, all the temporary, all the temporary results that we have. I can move this anywhere that makes sense to see. Maybe. Come on. Okay. So this p is basically getting this, L is getting this, and then L1 is representing this whole expression, and then L2 is representing this whole expression, and finally we put here the return value, which we give in this expression. Okay, I hope this helped.